All right. So a wonderful good evening and welcome to this indeed practice talk for CPPCon. I think most of you know me already um, and Lucas has already introduced me as um, one of the um, organizers of MOOC++. And you might know me good enough to know that lately I'm talking a lot about software design. And today I've picked a particular topic. I've picked the type erasure design pattern and I want to analyze it from a design perspective. A lot of other talks have talked about type erasure before, so you actually might know the technique already, but you might not have seen what from a dependency point of view this technique actually can give you. So actually I'm talking about the root of all problems of software development, which is change. And this is something that probably should not be very unexpected because that actually is the truth in our industry. Software must be adaptable to frequent changes. That, by the way, is the reason why software is called software. It's not a coincidence. The term software kind of contains the information that it is expected to change easily. However, as you know from your own experience, it's not that easy. Most of the, uh, in most of the time, it actually feels quite hard to change software, to extend software properly. Because there is a problem, a core problem that we have to face every day, that problem that probably um, keeps us from doing an easy job, and that is dependencies. Dependencies, this is what makes your life so much harder. Uh, so you want to change something in A, suddenly you have to deal with B too, you didn't expect that. And when changing something in B, suddenly C and D break, and you have no idea why there is a connection between these. So after all, it's indeed always about dependencies. And that is what we are going to talk about today dependencies between um, different entities and how these techniques that I'm going to talk about can help you. So just to let one of the experts um, actually point out that dependency truly is a problem. Dependency is the key problem in software development at all scales, as Ken Beck said in TDD by example. So the example I've chosen for tonight is a simple example. An example that I've chosen, picked a few times already, and I know, when I say it's about shapes, most of you are immediately complaining. There's so much more interesting topics, there's so much more interesting examples. However, it's a simple example. And especially with an advanced technique like type erasure that we'll see uh, in a bit, I believe a simple example is actually helping quite a lot. You don't have to think about the example anymore. It's too familiar. You can fully focus on the technique and also on the dependency structure. So although this may be a pretty lame example, it is easy and let's just um, call it a traditional example. That's okay. So let's start with some abstraction called shape and I want to draw them. And of course now I can create any kinds of shapes, circles, squares, and you can of course imagine many more, triangles, rectangles, ellipses, whatever you feel is necessary. Of course I have to implement draw somehow. The initial reaction, the initial opinion is that we can implement draw in circle and square, essentially because we have to. However, from a dependency point of view, this of course is a, is a real flaw, a serious flaw. Because as soon as you implement draw within circle, you have a severe dependency on some kind of graphics tool. There may be entire graphics library like OpenGL, VTK, Metal Vulkan, whatever you prefer. And that is definitely not something to want to have in software. You don't want to have too hard dependencies on, on big uh, uh, libraries, external things, uh, third, part, uh, third party tools, etc. So thinking about this, you might realize that th that is actually a very, very simple solution. You could just inherit more. So we could implement drawing in different um, deriving classes, OpenGL circle and metal circle, now indicating which kind of library you're using in this case. Circle itself stays abstract and the implementation details are just moved down the hierarchy, which of course gives you an additional benefit. Suddenly it's easy to add new libraries, new implementations. Now um, you can easily introduce a, a Vulkan circle if you want to. And of course, we do the same thing on the right hand side, do the same thing for square two. 
For now, this may be okay. However, the real problem starts if we consider a different operation, serialize. And in fact, this is one of the big weaknesses of object-oriented programming, adding new operations. This really is difficult because now, of course, serialize has to be implemented too. And the first idea is perhaps we just need the according number of driving classes. So what comes to mind is an OpenGL little endian circle. Because serialize, of course, can be implemented by using little or big endian. So of course, we also need an OpenGL big endian version. And of course, because we need other libraries, graphics libraries, we have a metal little endian circle and a metal big endian circle. And many, many, many more classes. What doesn't work well in this approach is reuse. So I've implemented draw with OpenGL twice, at least. Depends on how many other um, operations I have. I've also implemented the little endian approach twice, which is of course not what you want to have. So perhaps we should rather consider this approach. We simply reuse what we have implemented here and we simply implement serialize on one other layer. Still, I hope at this point you already realize that this is a strategy that doesn't scale. It definitely doesn't e give you easy maintenance. Um, what do we do if you get a third operation and a fourth one? Adding another library layer again and again. So we need to start to handle dependencies. We need to start to handle um, the polymorphism in this context. So the disadvantages so far, when we just use inheritance naively, then we get a lot of derived classes with admittedly totally ridiculous names. Yeah, open GL little Indian circle. We actually get truly deep inheritance hierarchies, which makes it really hard to understand the problem. There's a lot of duplication. Whereas we add in, um, intuitively would argue that inheritance makes it easy to reuse stuff. Apparently it's not that easy. And maintenance, I believe, is severely impeded. So also extensions, adding another operation, you realize is seriously expensive from a working point of view and might not even be realistic in, in some bigger context. So the solution, of course, is not inheritance because inheritance, as Andrew Hunt and Davis Thomas said it, is rarely the answer. What you should do is we should use containment or as they say, we should delegate to services. Has a trumps is a. The solution of course is design patterns. And I'm picking one of them for now. One from the uh, Gang of Four book, the classic designs pattern book. Um, and just to recap quickly, what is a design pattern? Well, a design pattern has a name, has an intent, carries an intent, and it always aims at reducing dependencies in one specific way. So it provides some sort of abstraction that helps you to increase, to improve your maintainability. And of course, a design pattern is also proven over to work over the years, which means it doesn't fall from the sky. You have to find the same approach in a couple of places. This is what also what the going afford did. Um, if a pattern appeared in at least three code bases, then it was worthy to um, to be called a pattern. And pattern I now pick is the so-called strategy design pattern. One of the classics, one of the patterns that you definitely should have uh, in your toolbox. So here on the left-hand side, I first have some shape. And just to be clear, this is not the base class shape that we've seen before. This is now a concrete kind of shape circle, square, whatever kind of shape you, you prefer. What you want to do is not to inherit from this shape directly, from this circle, square, etc. But we are introducing some new in, um, inheritance hierarchy. Shape now owns one of these. Now, usually it owns a pointer to a strategy. And because now I want to deal with drawing specifically, I call this the draw strategy. This extraction of implementation details, by the way, is exactly what the single responsibility principle tells us to do. SRP tells us that we should separate concerns that do not strictly belong. 
And drawing just isn't a part of a shape of a circle, a square, etc. It just isn't. So we identify this as a variation point. We extract the information by means of some abstraction indeed. And suddenly we are able to implement all kinds of implementation. So we now can use OpenGL, we can use any kind of library, and we could also, also very easily introduce something for testing, test strategy. That, by the way, is exactly the kind of design that the open close principle wants, wants us to have. OCP tells us that we should design such that extension is easy. And suddenly it is easy. If you want to introduce a new library, everything's easy to do. Now we to create a new um, kind of strategy. We derive from the draw strategy base class and we don't have to change any existing piece of code. Really nice. So this strategy design pattern um, is now something where you say, well, do we really program with a strategy design pattern today? C++ is not really object oriented anymore. Oh, well, so just to show you that you're actually using strategy probably on a daily basis, I mean, you first say that strategy is definitely not something that's limited to object oriented programming, nor is it limited to dynamic polymorphism, or it's definitely also not some language specific idiom. You'll find this anywhere. And so just to give you a couple of examples from the standard library, std accumulate, believe it or not, but accumulate is based on a strategy design pattern. You have the ability to provide any way to, um, yeah, to uh, yeah, that a reduction strategy. That thing here is based on the strategy design pattern. Then you definitely know a std vector. You might also use it every day. It's based on strategy. The implementation detail of how to allocate is extracted just by means of a template argument. Or anode.z has three strategies the hash, the key equal, and the allocator. E exactly the same idea. And of course, most of you use unique pointer on a daily basis, and also unique pointer employs the same idea, the strategy design pattern. So strategy is not something old, outdated. It's actually pretty much up to date. And the idea is, as I said, to extract some implementation details. So we have these, these shape-based classes, Nothing changes here. We have draw, we have serialize, and potentially a lot of other operations. And then we introduce this strategy base class. That is now entirely focused on drawing. So there's only draw. We can draw circles. Um, it's pure virtual. It's made for uh, extension. Now, the interesting piece, the thing that is then interesting for us later also, is the circle class itself. The goal is to extract all dependencies, drawing dependencies from circle. So the circle class does not really implement draw itself anymore. Instead, in the constructor, in this example now, it is given a unique pointer to a draw circle strategy. This is the dependency that is given from the outside. And this is why we call this dependency injection. So we get one of these strategies, we move it into our data member, and from that moment on, we own the strategy. From that moment on, we know how to draw. Yes, I'm ignoring any kind of null pointer checks at this point. I just say, well, if somebody wants to draw me, I forward this request to my strategy. And suddenly the dependency on drawing details is gone. Suddenly I don't have to know about OpenGL, Metal Vulcan 3X or whatever anymore. And that of course allows me much, much, much easier maintainability. Still, a circle knows about drawing. It's still an affordance, something that the base class requires. The base class requires me to implement a draw function, but it's a public interface. So I don't know about the details anymore, but I still have to do something about this affordance, uh, this, this particular operation. So. There's a, at least a logical dependency. Okay, and as I said before, we can implement this in various ways. Um, whatever you have available, you can use it. Which, however, is definitely a great step forward. 
because from a dependency point of view, you have actually made a lot of progress. The base class is on the highest level. And I know that these terms in, in architecture, high level and low level, are a little bit um, yeah, uh, confusing. So allow me quickly to recap what this means. High level is the level where I do not expect any changes. Usually this is made up of the, the most abstract details. Uh, okay, abstractions, not really implementation details. So shape is on the highest level. And this can be implemented one level below in various ways. On this level, however, I also introduce the different ways to deal with drawing. So I introduce the draw circle strategy. That's a direct dependency, an interdependency between circle and a strategy. I need to know about circles here, and I need to know about a draw stra uh, circle strategy here. But by doing this, I actually gain implementation flexibility concerning the details. OpenGL strategy is then on the lowest level, the most detailed and the most volatile piece of implementation. So I have properly managed my dependencies. Basically, I've created some kind of architecture with a clear flow of dependencies. So the red arrows are dependencies. Everything points upwards. This is, by the way, what we also call dependency inversion. So perfect solution from a dependency point of view. I shouldn't say perfect at this point. Um, and we've gained a lot. So we have extracted the implementation details. This is what SRP tells us to do. We've also created the opportunity for easy extension, the open close principle. We've separated interfaces, the interface segregation principle, and we've reduced duplication. There is no duplication anymore. We have one implementation of drawing with OpenGL. That's nice. I've definitely limited the depth of the inheritance hierarchy big advantage, and I believe I can say that we have simplified maintenance. All right, this might be a nice time for questions. Are there any questions so far? There are no questions so far. Perfect. Because you might think, is this truly the way to go? Because we have we have gained something in terms of dependencies, but we have a lot of disadvantages too. First, that the performance is significantly reduced to due to a second interaction. There's two virtual function calls now. First, a draw function on shape, and then another virtual function call on the strategy. Definitely not good for performance. Performance is also reduced due to small manual allocations. There's many. I usually uh, create circles, squares, and all the other shapes by individual allocation. And there is quite a lot of pointers floating around, which also definitely doesn't um, help with performance. So the performance of the solution is limited. From a um, dependency point of view, however, it's kind of complicated to, to do because we need one strategy for every operation. We talked about draw only, but there's also serialize and potentially some more operations. And I definitely don't want to combine them because then I have the same problem again. So I need one strategy for every operation, which creates a lot of additional um, inheritance hierarchies. I need a lot of pointers in my original class. It's not really fun to do. And I need to manage lifetimes explicitly. Okay, and I mentioned already the proliferation of inheritance hierarchies. There's suddenly there's many. Have one for every operation and one for every uh, concrete type. This is just how strategy originally works, the object-oriented one. All right, last but not least, this is what I uh, mentioned before, circles, squares, etc. still know about their affordances. They still know that they can be drawn, that they can be serialized. Although strictly speaking, also this is a detail that I would like to extract because it still couples. So at this point, you realize that the object-oriented solution is definitely not the primary solution, the best solution that we have today. And this is exactly what Jean Perrin talked about in a pretty famous talk that you may be very well aware of, the talk Inheritance is the Base Class of Evil. 
in this talk, which is actually quite short, it's only about um, 20 minutes, or I should say he actually was given 20 minutes. He used 24 of these 20 minutes. Um, in these 20 minutes, he first of all complains about object-oriented programming for good reasons. A lot of the points that he makes are also now present in our solution. However, he also gives a solution how they solved it in the development of Photoshop. And he basically told us about type erasure, the pattern that I now also use. Interestingly, this talk therefore gives the impression that yeah, Jean Perrin and or the Photoshop team in, uh, introduced and invented this solution, which is not quite true. To my best knowledge, the very first mentioning of this technique is actually happened in the year 2000 in this paper, Valued Conversion. Conversions, which is a paper written by Kevlin Henney and an absolutely brilliant paper. I definitely recommend to you read it because first of all, it opens your eyes a little bit about yeah, the, the approach that I'm now talking about. And also, this is indeed the first, to my best knowledge, as I said, implementation of any. Uh, so 17 years before we stood any, we had a paper about the implementation of any. Now, type erasure. When I say type erasure, you might have many, many different things in your mind. For instance, you might think about void pointers, pointer to bases, and things like std variant. Just to be clear, type erasure is none of these. Definitely not. It is sometimes used for these, but you know, it has nothing to do with these different things. Type erasure is not just, I don't know a type. Type erasure is indeed a specific technique. It employs a templated constructor plus a completely non-virtual interface. That is indeed a, a very important part of type erasure. But in effect, it is a design pattern, which in itself is a combination of other existing design patterns. Most importantly, the design pattern external polymorphism, bridge, and prototype. This is now the three design patterns that we'll see in action. We'll actually see how they help to tear dependencies apart, to actually free you from a lot of dependencies by just using the technique. So we go back to the example that we've seen before. I now implement exactly the same example. I implement drawing shapes. However, very differently and in steps. So hopefully you can follow this along much, much easier than uh, the solution that John Perrin presented in his talk. So we start with concrete types, circle, and of course also square. Note, however, that both of these classes are very, very basic. There's a constructor, there's some getters, there's some data members. There is nothing about any kind of operation so neither circle nor square know about drawing or serialization. And why should they? This is just geometric primitives. They don't, they don't have to or should not know about everything that is done with them later. Also note specifically that they don't have any kind of base class. So there is no shape base class anymore. We will not need it. So there's also no virtual functions, of course, and more specifically also, there is no connection between circles and squares. So standalone types that have never seen each other, that don't know about each other, no dependency at all. Then the big question is, how can I actually create a relation between them? Well, what I now introduce is two helper classes. The first one I call shape concept. That will be a classic base class, uh, a base class with um, a virtual destructor, and I'm introducing a shape model, which is not just a class, it's a class template. Shape model takes anything, any type, any T, and this shape model is inheriting from this shape concept. Shape model specifically has a constructor that takes a T and it stores a T by value. So it can store, will store, circles, squares, triangles, rectangles, and all the other shapes directly by value. 
Now, in the base class, I formulate the same affordances that I've um, mentioned before. Serialization, drawing, and of course, potentially many more. These affordances now need to be implemented in the derived class. So I implement serialize, I implement draw. This, however, now defines the real requirements on the given type T. Note that I've specifically um, chosen to have a free function that is called on whatever object I have. So that I have a serialized function for circles, that I have a draw functions for squares. At this point, I specifically define the requirements and I now require that every type that is given to a shape model has a free function serialize and a free function draw. And note, technically, that a virtual function is not on demand instantiated, but right away, immediately. As soon as I create a shape model for a circle, I need these operations for circle. All right. This is, by the way, the design pattern that I mentioned before. This is the so-called external polymorphism design pattern. With this design pattern, you're able to create an inheritance hierarchy for a type that has never heard about polymorphism before. So this external hierarchy allows us to deal with shapes, uh, so any shapes, circles, squares, etc., polymorphically, which is a seriously interesting um, pattern indeed, because with this pattern, any type can behave polymorphically easily. This, by the way, is indeed an official design pattern introduced by Cleland Schmidt and Harrison in 1969 and 1996. I'm sorry. So a little after the design patterns book. And it's written in exactly the same style. The first thing they mention is the intent, then comes um, explanations, etc., cetera, uh, examples, etc. Cetera. So a classic design pattern, just not one of the most famous golf patterns. So this design pattern allows any object to be treated polymorphically, not just the ones with a virtual function. It extracts implementation details, it helps at least, and it also allows us to remove dependencies to any kind of affordance. Because I require a free function, any circle, any square doesn't have to know about these anymore. And this will now allow us to create um, very easy extensions. All right, back to the code. As I said, we now require that circles, squares, etc., have these operations. These functions, however, do not have to live with circles and squares. They're totally external. Now, circles have still nothing to do with draw. They come from a completely different direction. You can provide them in any way you want. So this is exactly the requirements, the resolution of the requirements of this external polymorphism class. Then, of course, when we use them, for instance, to draw an entire vector of shapes, we would call draw, and this draw function on the shape concept would do whatever is necessary to call the, um, the right draw function here. So if I have, in the end, a shape model of circle, this draw function would be called. And we would create shape models, of course. Make unique shape model of circles, of squares, and we create a lot of them. So this already works, and this already has helped us to tear apart dependencies. Circles, shape, any kind of shape does not have any dependency anymore on any of these affordances. Much more aggressive decoupling than the strategy design pattern enabled us to do. However, I bet you're not happy yet, simply because at this point, we still have this rather unnice um, object-oriented approach. We create pointers to derived classes. We treat them then as pointers to base. Not particularly beautiful. This is now where we extend this external polymorphism and we're moving in direction of type erasure. We in C++ for a long time have used value semantics as a driving design um, pattern. No, no, design pattern, a design solution. What we're now doing is we're moving these two structs. So 
the shape concept and the shape model into the private part of a class called shape. We don't want to see them anymore. What we want is we want the effect, but we don't want to deal with pointers to base. We would like to have values, and this shape class is going to give us exactly that. However, the first step, of course, is to actually make it uh, make um, to automate the process of if before done manually. The shape class is given a templated constructor. Template type name T. This T here can be any kind of shape. Again, this is circle, square, triangle if you have one. This is the concrete kind of shape. And this T instantiates a model of T directly without any, uh, any detour. At this point, we are implicitly checking the affordances. Does T provide all or resolve all the requirements that are given? If yes, we actually can instantiate a shape model for this type T. If not, we'll get a compilation error. Something that, by the way, you can very, very nicely handle with C20 concepts. So, new shape model creates a shape model. We assume this works, but we store it in terms of a pimple, a unique pointer to base. So, while the constructor now builds some kind of bridge to the other type, this pimple now introduces the so-called bridge design pattern. Pimple, you know, might know about the pimple idiom. This is the basic, the most basic form of the bridge design pattern. Usually in C++, this is just one particular class that uh, is kept in a CPP file to cut dependencies on implementation details. This time, however, it's a real bridge because the type is polymorphic can be any kind of model. And fascinatingly, it is created on the fly. You don't write any concrete bridge. The compiler writes it for you, for circles, for squares, for any other type, automatically. So we can now store these things automatically. So your unique point of pimple will also deal with the memory management. Very nice, still in the private part of the class, so we never see this explicitly anymore. But now, of course, we um, we want to make this um, the shape class as usable. We want to we want to give it the same interface as for the, all the other kinds of shapes. For that reason, we introduce serialize and draw also for shape. But this is now where the magic happens. This draw function is supposed to just trigger the draw function on the given pimple. This is why I make it a friend. I need to have access to this private pimple. And this is where I actually introduce the virtual function call. It is a virtual function call, essentially, regardless however you implement it. This is the interaction. But thanks to this internal external uh, internal implementation of external polymorphism, this draw function um, triggers this polymorphic behavior. So we use it as a value but still internally it uses dynamic polymorphism. All right, still it's not truly a value yet. For that purpose, we now need the special member functions. So we need, of course, the copy operations, copy constructor and copy assignment operator. And we also, of course, want to use the move operations, the move constructor and the move assignment operator. This is what we expect on a proper value type. Good news is that two of these are very, very easy to handle, and that's, of course, the move operations. Since we use a unique pointer, that is for free. We can simply default them. However, the copy operations are a little more difficult because all we have is pointers to base classes. We have a unique pointer to a shape concept. We actually don't know what kind of model hides behind this abstraction. And we truly have no idea the type has been erased by simply storing this, um, this base pointer. In other words, we cannot really create a copy of whatever you store. Not yet. But you can easily do this by introducing yet another design pattern, which is the so-called prototype design pattern. What we now do is we introduce another affordance 
introduced by means of the clone function. That clone function is the affordance of copyability. So we now require that whatever type we have in T is actually copyable. So circles, quests, etc., must be copyable, else it wouldn't work. But this clone function, which returns a unique pointer to base, is now implemented in the Rife class. That derived class that knows exactly what T it stores. The shape model knows whether it stores a circle, a square, or something else. So this clone function can be implemented, creating an exact copy of whatever it is, and I can return an abstraction again, a unique pointer to shape concept. The prototype design pattern. Seriously important at this point, and despite the fact that, of course, this is the object-oriented design pattern, this does its job perfectly. So note that anytime you write a clone function, you probably want to use this design pattern. And if you see a clone function, it very much, very, very likely uh, introduces and implements this design pattern. Very important in this context. All right. What we now have in addition is that draw all shapes can suddenly be implemented in terms of values. I do not have a vector of pointers anymore, of unique pointers to some base. I have a vector of shape objects. This object is copyable, it is movable, and it, of course, abstracts from many different kinds of shapes. So I don't need a pointer to base anymore. This shape class um, actually represents the abstraction. I can traverse them and I can draw them. By means of the draw function that I introduced as a friend, this draw function will trigger the polymorphic behavior. That is what ultimately triggers this external polymorphism hierarchy. And if you look at the main function, you can only admit that the usage is absolutely beautiful. Since we only have a vector of shapes, and since this even allows us to implicitly convert anything to, to a shape, you simply can create circles and squares directly. So I create a circle, I push it into this vector of shapes. I create a square, I push it in the vector of shapes. Really beautiful and really intuitive. This is something that everybody can understand intuitively. So I have a circle, that's a shape. Well, I should be able to actually add it to a vector of shapes. Really beautiful. And really, really fascinating that this actually works. All right. However, back to the in uh, to the dependency structure, which I believe is the most important um, thing. You do remember that I said explicitly that circles and squares no longer have any kind of dependency. That's true. There's no dependency from circle to anywhere else. There is no base class. There is no operation to depend on they did most definitely also don't depend on the implementation details. However, conceptually, on a higher level, I now introduce the abstraction shape. With all this ex uh, external polymorphism content, that is now the abstraction of any kind of shape. So it's on a higher level because it still represents um, a more abstract concept than circles and squares. However, here, we now actually define requirements. Here, we actually say that uh, shapes need to be drawable. So draw, the operation, of course, now depends on circles. I need to draw them, of course, but it, of course, also depends on the requirement post here. So it's a much simpler, much more straightforward um, dependency structure with less errors and also less um, dependencies on the types. Interesting, however, is also that this structure becomes possible due to this template class, the shape model, which is introduced automatically at the point where you create a new shape for a circle, for instance. This is the point where we instantiate these, um, these instantiations of shape model. And so this is indeed the bridge pattern that uh, allows us to decouple so aggressively. So perfect application of templates indeed. Uh, introducing something um, in another level on, in our architecture. So much, 
much cleaner and definitely something that um, yeah, reduces dependencies significantly. It actually works so nicely that Eric Niebler in um, um, 2020, so June 2020, tweeted about this. If I could go back in time and had the power to change C++, rather than adding virtual functions, I would add, lang add language support for type erasure and concepts. Define a single type concept, automatically generate a type erasing wrapper for it. Of course, what he's talking about is indeed language support in the sense of you don't have to write this for yourself anymore. But just providing a concept and abstraction, the compiler should actually be able to define such a wrapper on its own. That is the future, of course. But from a technique point of view, this is something that a lot of other programming languages use. So by using type erasure, we've actually dealt with dependencies much more aggressively than before. We've extracted implementation details, even so that there is no dependency to these details anymore, not even from a logical point of view. We have an enormous opportunity for easy extension. You can add new types by just writing a new class. You don't have to make it known anywhere. Uh, triangle, rectangle, all these classes are easily possible. And you can also introduce new operations super easily. There's almost no linking uh, uh, dependencies available. We still separate interfaces. We have still reduced duplication quite, quite significantly. And we have removed all dependencies to any kind of affordance. There's no inheritance hierarchies left. OK, true, there is one inside the class, but officially we don't know about this. Suddenly, the inheritance hierarchy becomes an implementation detail itself. We've also no pointers on the outside anymore. Yeah, again, inside we have a unique pointer to base, but the pointers are pretty much gone. I don't have any manual dynamic allocation on the outside anymore, and I don't have to do any explicit lifetime management on my own anymore. All of these details, the nasty things that we don't want to see any uh, every time, are suddenly nicely encapsulated in this type erasure class. And coincidentally, we have also introduced a much, much better performance. That, however, is now something that definitely goes beyond this talk. I wanted to focus on the dependencies. But there is many, many talks that have been given in the past that cover the performance aspect. So, for instance, Zach Lane talked about this. Um, Arthur Twy to some extent, but definitely Cy Brandt and Edomar de Madrid, um, two experts on type erasure, regularly talk about performance and demonstrate that by just properly encapsulating this, um, you, you can gain performance from just 10 to 50 percent, depending on, on what you do. And just to point out where a lot of performance is hidden, of course, it is hidden in how you truly allocate stuff. By just introducing a storage policy for a shape, we can significantly improve performance. Small shapes don't have to be allocated anymore. Small shapes can be um, like a small string optimization stored inside the class. And large types, well, they have to be allocated dynamically. And in case you, you're asking, of course, this is the strategy design pattern again. Apply it in form of a template parameter to allow us to configure how things are allocated from the outside. And there's such an enormous performance gain uh, here. Um, it's hard to, to just um, give you verbally. So please watch one of these other talks. By the way, one of the disadvantages, of course, that getting it to, getting it to run is a little harder. It's a little harder because you have to write this wrapper, this type erasure wrapper yourself. And if you really, really are interested in performance, of course, there's a lot of design um, internal implementation details to consider and a lot of difficulties to overcome. Therefore, I would argue use one of the available libraries. There is Zoo, which is a GitHub library. So this is CPP Zoo. There is Dino, which is a little older, not really up to date anymore, but still interesting. And of course, there's the classic boost type erasure library. Now, there's many more. I apologize if I now miss any of these uh, libraries. But just to point out, there is already libraries that make it super simple for you to actually use that. 
You get all the advantages with minimum implementation effort. All right, to summarize, type erasure is not void pointers, uh, variants pointer to base now. Variant is a templated constructor, which is super important to actually bridge our architecture to, to introduce newly generated code into the lower level of the architecture, plus a completely non-virtual interface. Also, type erasure is like a compound type, uh, design pattern. It is a design pattern that in, uh, contains external polymorphism, bridge, and prototype, at least. So, of course, you saw that we might act, uh, add uh, some strategy in there or other things, but it's at least this combination. And I believe because of this compound nature, it's actually one of the most interesting design patterns today. Something that um, you definitely should at least consider. Okay, so type erasure significantly reduces dependencies, especially on the affordances, but also on the types that um, are used. It enables you to use value semantics, something which is um, today in C++ um, used everywhere. Yeah. There's a lot of, of uh, types, of value types in, in the standard library. It helps you to improve performance from very little to quite a lot, depending on what you want to do. And on the using side, not necessarily in the wrapper, but on the using side, it definitely improves readability and comprehensibility. And for this, it easily eases maintenance. Because of this combination, Tiberia in other programming languages is actually the default. So if you're taking a look at, at Rust, at Go, or Swift, under the hood, there's a lot of type erasure happening already. You don't actually see it, you don't realize it, but sometimes um, yeah, other broken languages actually pave the way that we realize that this might be a good idea too. So hopefully this talk to help a little bit that you realize there is a lot to gain here, especially from a dependency point of view, but also as so many other talks pointed out, Definitely also from a performance point of view. Okay, thank you very much. And um, now there's, there's a good time to take uh, any question, if there's any. So, first of all, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, wonderful talk. Um, there are a couple of questions, actually, there are very many questions. Um, Let's just go through them chronologically as they appeared. Um, All right. So, uh, and of course, thank you for giving this talk. Um, could you please, uh, I'm trying to pronounce the name, Rabin Rian. Could you please elaborate on the difference between dependency inversion and dependency injection? All right. Um, I'm thinking, should I go back to a particular slide? It happened before slide 27, and it was mentioned on slide 27. I could go back to the overview of strategy, so here. So, there is indeed a big difference. Um, so, in uh, uh, basically saying these two have nothing to do with each other, but of course are very, very nicely combined. Because I've extracted the variation point of drawing uh, a circle, for instance. Because of that, I'm now able to feed this dependency from the outside. So I'm now able to implement different kinds of strategies without this particular shape having to know about drawing now, or any drawing detail. This is what we call dependency injection. So I'm passing a pointer in this classic setting at least um, to this, this strategy from the outside via constructor or via setter both is possible and reasonable. And by that, I'm able to configure something for, for some time. Yeah, so please now use OpenGL. Oh, now I've changed my mind. Let's please use uh, 3EX. So dependency injection. Dependency inversion means, and for that, I go back to the structure, the, the architecture view. Dependency inversion means that indeed, you want to steer dependencies in a specific direction in order to create some kind of architecture. An architecture is only an architecture if all dependency errors cross an architectural boundary in one direction. If there is a dependency from, say, this level down here, it's not an architecture anymore. 
you cannot separate concerns. Dependency injection, uh, dependency inversion is now what we call the fact that we have truly achieved this upward error from the low level to the high level, which means that essentially we have, for instance, in this case, um, we, we have to have this um, this base class on the on the high level or here middle layer, um, and the implementation on the low level. If this is not a given, then that and there's no architecture. Okay, I hope this was somewhat clear. If not, uh, please ask a follow-up question or uh, come to our after talk chat. I would say, given the the amount of questions, please come to the after talk chat. Um, right. Okay, Jakubit um, asks, where were the manual allocations specific to the strategy pattern uh, slide 28? 28. Um, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, once more. So. You mean the man, uh, manual allocation that we that I mentioned here? I, I, I think so. So the manual mm -hmm. allocations happened essentially. Okay, I didn't show this on the slide. Good point. You usually create a circle by saying new circle, or in a modern way, make make unique circle. You would create a circle in order to have a vector of circle. Uh, sorry, a vector of shape pointers. Shape being the base class. Um, because I want to have all kinds of shapes together, I need these pointers to base. And as a consequence, not a necessary consequence, but a usual consequence, we allocate things dynamically. And of course, this is, uh, creates a burden for, um, for you because you have to allocate explicitly. It also, however, creates a burden on a memory system. There's a lot of, of little pieces of memory floating around which not necessarily are nicely aligned uh, and not, not um, coming behind each other. So these pointers point to various places memory. And of course, this has an impact on performance. OK, good point. This is something I probably should should add to the slides again. I, I shorten it a little bit. OK, now we have two questions from CVP Powell um, on slide 31. They ask, don't you mean templated constructor or template? As a, or the, the or part is important here. Don't you mean templated constructor or templated assignment? I believe the constructor is the, the key point. Of course, you can have a template assignment operator that allows you to change this later, but you will need a template constructor in order to create one of these objects. So that is key. The other thing is optional. Of course, we could mention that the templated assignment operator as well. But as I said, this is key. That truly makes type erasure work. Um, now, of course, my implementation was simplified. Since I don't want to talk about all the details, implementation details, but on the dependency issues. Um, so I didn't have an assignment operator for that. But you're absolutely correct. This is reasonable. OK, yeah. I think that's a good answer. On slide 38, uh, CVPEL asks again, um, why necessarily free functions? You could have member functions without any base class. Is this targeted for ADL? That is a good question too. I did not explicitly mention that. I just said that at this point, you define your affordances. You define I think this was uh, specifically something I highlighted here. You define the requirements. And I specifically indeed chose the free function because that now allows me to completely cut all kinds of dependencies between types and, and affordances, meaning operations. Because of that, a circle doesn't have to have a draw member function. It doesn't have, it can be completely oblivious of drawing, of serialization, of any other operation just can represent the basic geometric primitive that it is. So you can define anything you want at this point. You can require a, a member function, absolutely. You can even implement it such that you check what an object can, can provide. You can check, do you have a member function? If yes, I call that. 
do you have a free function? If yes, I call that. Yeah, you can prioritize these. There's a lot of options, a lot of implementation details though. From a dependency point of view, however, the free function of course rules. Of course, this introduces ADL, that's the point to some extent, um, but because of that, indeed, I can amazingly cut dependencies. Uh, after all, this is, however, this, um, this idea of external polymorphism. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Ninki Ba asks, um, I think you already answered this, but just let's reiterated could we made could we avoid the allocation of the pimple by using some kind of small shape optimization yeah so probably um uh, jonathan asked this before uh, i, I think actually should it. i still here hope so check so hopefully i'm still here andreas can you still hear him i'm, I'm not sure See. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jonathan probably asked this question before uh, I showed this slide. Absolutely, um, we can make make this happen very very easily. I say easily when I actually mean that the implementation details are now starting to get a little gory. But um, this template parameter is actually um, super important if you really want to squeeze maximum performance out of the idea of type erasure. This, however, is something that a lot of people have talked about before. Um, so um, I only mentioned this in, in this one slide. Yeah, but good question. Thank you. OK. While Lucas is uh, figuring out his uh, his audio setting. I, I just take a look at the chat and I see a question from CP Pell. Um, type erasure is also known as something that often actually comes with a performance hit. Stood function as an example. So let's be honest, stood function is uh, a messed up implementation of type erasure. This is something that you should, of course, not do in this way. Stood function, unfortunately, comes with a lot of other kinds of dependencies. So you are depending on RTDI, you're depending on uh, memory allocation, you're depending on, on many things that you don't want to depend on. So the function is a poor example. Yes, it's an example for type erasure, but it's not a good example for how to do it properly. We want to cut dependencies, not introduce new ones. So good point. Type erasure is not necessarily working well. Yeah, you, we can also mess this up. But you can also do it properly, as hopefully I could show here in the in this example. By the way, you're not the only one who complains about std function. Um, I've heard complaints for years, and I, I totally agree. Luckily, you can, in just 40 lines of code, implement your own std function, which is much faster. Something I regularly prove in my um, in my training classes. All right, Lucas. Are you back yet? OK. Um, Peter Lauro asks um, if I could elaborate on std any. std any is an example for type erasure. A very straightforward one. Um, std any just grabs any type, as the name suggests. Yeah, you can put integers, strings, and circles in there. There doesn't have to be any connection between these because std any is one of the type erasure forms that doesn't uh, require any affordance, except for copyability to some extent. But std any is just storing this. If you want to have it back, you can ask the any, please give it back. And if you're lucky, if you're asking for the right type, it actually gives you back the right thing. That's any. There is no no affordance like draw or um, or uh, serialize or any anything else. For that reason, it's kind of simple, simplistic. Okay, so CPPL is answered. 
so expensive in terms of performance or expensive in terms of um, implementation details. The second, I agree. If somebody wants to do something like this in the standard, that is kind of difficult. Performance, I would argue, uh, in the opposite direction. But of course, it always depends. All right, let me check if I... Okay, slide 54. Uh, for, for 50, yeah. So, since you have, since you are now in charge of providing draw, you can provide this in any way you want to. So, you could just write these draw functions with OpenGL, but you could probably extract this properly in the sense of um, you put this all in a CPP file and you can later link the right implementation. Yeah, so you put the burden on the configuration management. The code does not depend on OpenGL anymore. You could also, if you wanted to, use um, runtime um, injection still. Also, not not out of the uh, not, not out of the picture. So because you are totally in charge here, you can decide which draw operation is used. Yeah, um, in any way you can think of. All right, so, so how do you compare type erasure with CRTP? Big difference, CRTP does not properly introduce runtime polymorphism. CRTP introduces a base class that takes the, um, the type of the drive class, and for that reason, there is no common base class anymore. So you cannot have a vector of base cannot put them together. For that reason, of course, um, the application of CRTP is fundamentally different from the application of something as dynamic as type erasure. Type erasure is dynamic polymorphism, CRTP is not. You could now, of course, say there is still some dynamic uh, content, but most of the time you use it statically because that's the point. CRTP knows what the derived class is at compile time and because it knows that there is no overhead to you to virtual functions so there's a clear separation between these two techniques this is the one that is definitely more general crtp i would argue is um useful in a limited setting if you do have this uh, this compile time knowledge or do need this compile time knowledge still of course you might be able to combine these two this may be reasonable in some some context CTP introduces, can, or does also introduce some kind of um, dependence inversion, yes, a static one though. Uh, it's, um, you do have an abstraction, that's the CRTD base class. This abstraction can be used in a lot of places, but at a compile time you provide the derived type. So yes, there is a dependence inversion, absolutely. You can draw a um, nice diagram like this one, but it's not um, runtime. All right, Klaus, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, my system somehow decided to not cooperate anymore. Um, I'm I picked a couple of questions what the last the question chat. was that was asked. Um, so I, I not just picked the one question that Jakubit um, um, posted a, a couple of seconds ago. Does the name shape com concept imply that there is a relation with C plus twenty concepts? Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Indeed, this is this is a good question, and there is truth to that. The name concept is used because, indeed, there is a similarity between concepts and base classes. Both define requirements, requirements that derive types or um, things that you provide as template arguments need to fulfill. This is why I explicitly say concept, because this ultimately defines all the operations that need to be there. So our shape concept had a draw, had a serialize, had a clone function. So this implies that we need the drive class to be drawable, to be serializable, and to be copyable. Similar to concepts indeed. For that reason, you can actually check by means of C20 concepts if all these affordances are, um, are provided. For instance, here in the middle at this point here, 
this type name could be very, very easily replaced by a concept that at compile time checks all of these uh, requirements and gives nice error messages if something is not given. Uh, oh, you're not copyable. Doesn't work. Um, so there is a combination, and the name is chosen for the, exactly that reason, yes. 